The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book 3 The Monster in the Hollows. Chapter 16 Odo Helmer Falls in Love. Janner didn't realize how tired he was until his head hit the pillow. He and Kalmar had wrestled before dinner, after dinner, and after their baths. So by the time Naya finally ordered them to bed, they were both sweaty and out of breath. Janner opened one of the windows to let the cool air in, then blew out the lamp. Cal, come look at this, he whispered. Kalmar knelt beside Janner at the window. The stars seemed close enough to touch, and their beauty was a song in the dark silence of the sky. A night owl hooted from its perch in the tree outside the window. Somewhere in a distant pasture, a donkey brayed. The window faced the field behind Chimney Hill, and Janner could see beyond the fence a road rising and falling and twisting across the countryside, with lanes branching off and winding toward other homesteads and barns. Golden light glowed in the windows where people were still awake, reading or visiting or eating fruity desserts. The brothers knelt for a while in the quiet and looked out on the beauty of the hollows. It smells good here, Kalmar said. I can smell everything. The owl in the tree over there, the goats in the next pasture. They don't smell so good, I guess. I can smell apple butter on the hot bread in that house across the way. I don't know how I'm going to get to sleep. Janner had a thousand questions for Kalmar, but he hesitated to ask most of them. He didn't want his brother to feel any odder than he already did. Are there any other changes? I mean, like being able to smell everything? Kalmar thought for a moment. I can see better. I feel stronger, hungrier. I didn't think that was possible. You're always hungry. That's not what I mean. Then what do you mean? Kalmar's ears twitched and he shook his head. Nothing. Never mind. Janna heard frustration in his voice and decided to leave it alone. The silence was broken a moment later by the clop of hooves on the road and the squeak of tack and wagon. Although Janner knew there was no black carriage in Van Rona, the memory of it woke an old fear in his bones, and he sensed a shortness in Kalmar's breathing. For most of his life, he had lived in terror of the black carriage. It was impossible not to think about it. Two horses rounded the bend, pulling a wagon. A lantern swung from a hook, jutting into the air above the driver, and cast a weak yellow light. The driver was a skinny fellow in a riding cap, whistling a hollish tune. It's hard to believe we're not in danger anymore, Kalmar sighed and climbed into the top bunk. Will you close the window? Too many smells out there. Yeah, Janner said. He didn't remind Kalmar the truth, that they weren't out of danger. He'd seen enough of the Hollows folk and heard enough of Poto's stories to know that school in Van Rona was going to be tough. Janner tried to sleep, reminding himself that none of the Hollish school children had braved the Fork Factory, fought a fang, or sailed the Dark Sea of Darkness. How tough could they be? Janner woke to the smell of bacon and the sound of Kalmar bounding out of bed and down the stairs. He lay still for a few minutes, enjoying the murmur of morning chatter downstairs, the clank of dishes, and birdsong outside the window. Light fell on the hill outside and melted the frost. He got up and removed his bandages to apply the gadbalm ointment Naya had left on his desk. There was no blood and no scabbing. The scratches were clean and pink with scar tissue. In just two days, the cuts had closed and only ached a little when he touched them. When he came downstairs with a wad of bandages in his hand, he found Lily already up and wearing a new dress, one of Freva's that she had hemmed and adjusted for Lily just that morning. Lily's hair was braided and her face glowed with a good night's sleep. She smiled at Janner with jam on her cheeks. Poto sat at the other end of the table and palavered with Oscar and Bonifer. The presence of three old men in one house guaranteed that breakfast would be hearty every morning. Naya greeted Janner and sat him down in front of a plate of eggs, bacon, and toast with ermentine jam. I plan to prepare a plate of fruit and leafy greens, Naya said, but your grandfather would hear none of it. 
Meat, Poto said. Naya took the wad of bandages and inspected Janner's wounds. It looks like the gad bomb did quick work. How are your legs? Better, Janner said with a mouthful of toast. Reva shuffled out of the kitchen and offered Janner a cup of juice. Bibes, sir? Huh? Janner swallowed his food. Bibes? It's tangerade. Very sweet. Oh, yes, bibes would be fine. Thank you. He watched Freva as she hurried back into the kitchen, wondering why she was so bashful and wishing she wouldn't call him sir. He also wondered where her daughter was, and her husband too, for that matter. When you're finished, try these on. Naya placed a stack of new clothes on the table, along with a pair of clean, unworn boots. Janner could already tell they were finer clothes than he had ever owned. Kalmar emerged from behind the fireplace in his new outfit. He wore a white shirt with a stiff collar and a pair of black leggings. What about the boots? Naya asked, appraising him with her hands on her hips. They didn't fit. My feet aren't normal. Cal's ears lay flat, which Janner had figured out was the equivalent of his cheeks turning red. I'd rather go barefoot if that's all right. It is, Naya said. Off with you, Janner. I want to see if yours fit, too. Janner's boots were too big, but not by much. Poto said that at the rate his feet were growing, he'd soon need to wear boots, boats instead of boots. He couldn't remember ever getting new clothes in Glipwood. Clothes had always been handed down from the Blagus boys or made by Naya out of old scraps of fabric or tattered blankets. These were sturdy and clean, and with the new boots, he even felt taller. Now come here by the fire and let your photo tell you a few things about school in the Green Hollows. You'll need an idea of what's likely to happen today. I expect at least one of you will come home with a fat lip or a black eye. <laughs> Photo lit his pipe and waited for the children to gather around him on the thick rug. When I came to the hollows many years ago, I sailed through the water craw on the pirate ship, as rascally a sailor as you could imagine. I'd already lost my leg by then, and had sailed the sea maker knows how many times. I'd run with growlfist on the stranders, and had a bit of a reputation for rowdiness. <laughs> I was Podo Helmer, scale raker, and weren't afraid of nobody. So even though I'd heard that the hollish ways were rough and tumble, I thought nothing of it. Podo puffed on his pipe and stared at the fire. When I stepped off the ship and onto the pier, the first thing I saw wasn't the piles of fruit or the crowds of traders or the horses or the dogs. The first thing I saw was a woman. A woman with long hair the color of walnut and a face to stop your heart. She was carrying a basket of apples and was turning to greet someone. When she did, her red dress spun a bit. The sun leapt off the water and lit her face. And I felt me heart kick like a mule. Dad never felt that way before. Your children remember Nurgabog. Janner thought of the wretched old woman from the Strand crawling across the floor of the Strando burrow. Stranderboro, without a tooth in her head, wounded by her own son. She had loved Poto when she was young, and that love was all that had saved the wing feathers from Claxton Weaver and his band of thieves. Well, Nurgabog was a good woman in her way, but when I laid eyes on this woman in the market, I knew me whole life had come to a strong crosswind, and I had to decide whether to sail through it or let it carry me off. I decided that instant to marry her. And you fell in love, Lily sighed. She lay on her stomach with her chin in her hands, looking wistfully at Poto, which was what girls were supposed to do when they heard love stories, Janner thought. Nope, Poto said. I walked right up to her, bowed so low me nose scraped the cobbles and asked her name. Gwendolyn, Lily said, sighing again. I'm getting there, lass, Poto said. She smiled back at me, and I was certain I'd never be happy till I married her. We talked for hours, but I never paid much attention to what she was saying. I just kept looking at her face, the way she walked, wondering how I'd ever be happy without her. It was magic, I tell you. She brought me home to meet her father that very day. To this house, Lily said. Nope, 
to a house in town. Her father was a trader of fabric and wicker, sailed up and down the coast of Dang for weeks at a time, but he happened to be home this particular day. He was a fine feller, even if he couldn't spit right, and I settled for the, in for the interview. I figured he'd want to get to know the man who wanted to court his daughter. As we talked, the servant girl came in and offered us tea. I declined, but the man took some. He spilled a little on the floor and got all upset at the servant, started saying mean things to her, and I got right uncomfortable fast. The girl with the walnut hair came in and took up her dad's abuse. She shooed the poor servant girl out of the room and kicked her in the rump for good measure. Right before Zola May slammed the door. Zola May? Lily scrunched her face in confusion. Die! Right before Zola May slammed the door, I caught a glimpse of the servant girl's eyes. They were wild with strength, like looking at a wall of dark clouds dreaming across the sea to flatten your ship. Her face weren't pretty, but fair enough and flushed red from the pain of her treatment. Her hair was cut short and hung sad like around her eyes. Then the door slammed shut and she was gone. I was in an uncomfortable moment. I said, let's get back to talking courting. Well, Zola May turned on the prettiest smile he ever seen and sidled up to her father to cool his temper. He agreed to let me court his daughter right quick. And before he knew it, I bade farewell to me crewmates and to me life on the sea. I was tired of outrunning the sea dragons anyway. Thus began my courtship with Zola May Robochaw. I found lodging at a waterfront inn, got a job chopping glipper fish, and did me best to clean up me appearance. Combed me hair, even bathed once a week. I don't know what Zola May saw in me, but she loved me so. After a while, though, me heart stopped kicking like a mule and I started listening to her words. She talked on and on about her fine dresses, her disdain for the green hollows, which I was coming to love. And her ache to get out of town and see where we are. I was sick of traveling by now. Did anyways, I couldn't set foot on a boat without fear of the sea dragon swallowing me up. All the time I spent at the Robochaw place, I kept bumping into their servant girl. As I said, she wasn't pretty, not like Zola May. <laughs> but she had a way about her. I found that I enjoyed talking to her more than Zola May. And after two weeks, started visiting Zola May just so I could see how the servant girl was doing. She worked hard, scuffed the ang suffered the anger of Zola's dad in silence, and bore up when Zola May treated her worse than the family dog. Then everything changed. Photo leaned forward with a big smile. One day I was sitting on the garden bench out in front of Zola's house in the cool of the evening. We were talking about whatever, and I told the rat, rat that I didn't want to travel anymore. I didn't want to leave the hollows. I wanted to follow the maker's wind, and it was blowing me straight and through away from the wild of the waters and the solid ground. Zola rolled her eyes. That's a giant waste of time, she said. Don't you find me pretty, Podo? She stood up and twirled her dress and flung her pretty hair about because she knew I was weakened by that kind of beauty, like every man. But right at that moment, the servant girl walked by, leading a donkey loaded with vegetables for sale at the market. Her dog was at her side, and I saw the servant girl's hand lay on its head while they walked. She scratched it behind the ears and smiled at those who passed her. I knew in that instant that I'd be happier as the servant's dog than Zola May's husband. In the weeks I'd visited with Zola May, I never saw her lift a finger to work, never saw her speak a kind word to anyone but me or her father. She never listened much to me or what I cared about. When the servant girl passed, Zola May was still standing in front of me, trying to get me to stop using me brain and gaggle at her prettiness. And right then, right under the sweep of Zola May's walnut hair, that servant girl, I didn't even know her name yet because all they called her was servant. She looked at me and threw one of her simple smiles my way. It shot through that walnut hair of Zola's ridiculous twirling like a bolt of lightning. I stood up and excused myself. Don't Zola May, she could twirl all she wanted, but I wouldn't be around to see it. Poto laughed and smacked his knee. You should have seen her! 
She looked as shocked as if I'd just belched in her face. I limped down the road to catch up with the servant. Hers was a beauty of a better kind. The servant girl was Wendelin? Jenner asked. But this house is huge. Why is she a servant? Our family always believed that good work was better than wealth or status, Naya said. So even though they had enough money to enjoy a life of leisure, my grandfather and his grandfather before him made sure their children knew the value of good work and good rest. When I was a girl, I worked at the market for years. That's why you three have always had your share of chores. In Anaria, said Bonifer, it's not unusual to see your father has been pulling two potatoes out of the earth beside the farmers in the field. That he was the king. Not everyone agrees with this tradition, but it is hard to argue with the kindness that has always marked the Shining Isle. It started with the maker, then the kings, and it flowed down to the subjects of the kingdom like water from a river, irrigating the furrows. Everything grows better that way. So, did you marry her right away? Kalmar asked. I oh, wish I could have. Poto said with a chuckle. No, it wasn't as easy as I thought. I fell harder for Wendelin than I ever did for Zola May. In fact, from the moment I left Zola on her porch and chased after the servant girl with the donkey, something strange happened in me brain and me heart. I found all the things I believed beautiful about Zola had turned ugly, and all the things that were plain about Wendelin shone like rubies. Whenever I saw Zola in the market, I wondered what I'd ever seen in her. And when I looked at Wendelin, I saw her grace and her gentleness and deep waters and strength. She was the prettiest woman I'd ever seen, and that was in her work clothes. Grandpa, what does this have to do with school? Kalmar asked. Oh, I'm getting to that, lad. Coming here to Chimney Hill to meet Wendelin's parents was the start of the hardest thing I ever did. Now I fancied myself handsome. I was proud of me whiskers. Me long hair, me tattoos, and even of me stump. Poto stamped his peg leg on the floor. I wasn't afraid of anything. But when I met Cargan Igby, he was as big as round as a tree, and his arms were thick as sweeter melons. It was like meeting a kinder, less stinky version of Graufis the Strander King. Only this time I had to prove myself to his daughter. As soon as I walked up the lane and knocked on that front door over there, he flung it open, asked me name, and punched me in the nose so hard I didn't wake up until after dinner. That's awful, Neely said. What did you do to him? Nothing. I was an outsider. He said if I even looked at his daughter's direction, he'd suck me again. I wasn't afraid, though. I just went to her window and sang me sailor songs until old Cargan woke up and chased me over the hills. Half the time he caught me. And when he did, he whopped me good. And I'd wake up in the middle of a field with a bloody nose and a smile on my face. I had me affection set on Wendell and Igbe, and nothing could change that. But I was mighty perplexed. I asked around at the wharf and finally learned that it didn't do any good to mention the name of Wendell and Igbe. They'd got word from Karg and Igbe that I wasn't to speak to her. It didn't matter so much with Zola May because she was always flirting with the sailors. But with Wendelin, I was an outsider, asking to court the true daughter of the Hollows. That ain't something that happens in these parts. I didn't have a chance with her. Drop it, they said. But I'd see Wendelin and her dog in town, and I'd go mad wanting to talk to her. Now, as soon as I did, I was set upon by whole herds of Hollish men. They'd stop whatever they was doing and jump on me. They lost seven teeth. <laughs> Poto proudly showed them his gums. Ah, as soon as my intentions were known, I couldn't go near Wendelin without getting pounded. After a year, a year, mind you, I finally figured out what I had to do to win her hand. I had to compete in the Brannock Durga. What's that? Kalmar asked. It's a week of pounding, wrestling, chasing, and hurting. Poto winced at the memory. Every three years, the tribes of the Hollows travel to the field of Finlay, as they've done for an epoch. Any man fool enough to enter has a chance to be keeper of the Hollows. That's how Rudrick come to be keeper. Remember how big he is. He got the job because he won the Bannock Durga. 
and that's what I set out to do. Poto paused and puffed on his pipe, enjoying the surprise on his grandson's faces. That's right, I signed up. What few friends I had told me I'd better back out if I wanted to live. They weren't threatening me, mind you. They were worried about me. But I figured the only way I could show me deep love for Wendelin was to compete. And if I died trying, well, that was fine with me. And I loved her. Mother tried to stop him, too, Naya said. She came to his window one night and begged him not to go through with it. She said she would marry him and run away with him. But I wouldn't hear of it. Poto said, I was done running. Oscar left the table and joined the children on the carpet without Janner noticing. What happened next? He asked. He lay on his pillowy stomach, looking up at Poto like a bald toddler. In the words of Frisbee von Chittengon, do tell. I traveled to the field of Finley alone. I set up me tent and waited for the whistle harp to signal the start of the games. Pray unto the maker for strength and a sure and steady hand, but also for endurance. I didn't think I could lick a single one of these giant fruit-happy holish fighters, but I could endure. There's something that don't take strength of arm, but strength of heart, and me love for Wendelin had given me that. Did you win? What happened? Lily scooted over and leaned her head on Kalmar's shoulder. Janner thought his brother would squirm away, but he was too interested in the story to care. The first games was about speed. They were races. I'm pretty, pretty good with me stump, but, that, but not that good. I fared pretty bad. The worst of it was, the Hullish don't care much for sportsmanship. If you run a race, you'd better expect to get an elbow in the ribs or a fist in the jaw, and they try to trip you the whole time. Not just me either. I punched each other, too, and it was all a part of the game. The second day was about strength. They had barrels of water to lift, logs to throw, wagons to push. I did all right at that, but nothing close to the hullish brutes. I was making a right fool of myself. But the next three days were given to fights. I entered the field with 50 different opponents and lost nearly every fight. But I kept fighting. I could hardly walk. I was so tired but I kept swinging and dodging and getting back up. The last day was the toughest. It's about strength and speed and sneakery, too. It's a race to find McDulog's boot. Somebody hides it in the night before, and the first man to return it to the dais on the field of Finley wins the day. I hardly slept the night before, partly because my whole body was bruised, and partly because I knew it was my last chance to win the hand of Wendell and Igby. Me heart's true love. I woke at dawn with the rest of the men and waited for the whistle to blow. When it did, fists flew and men bellered just to get a lead on the others, even though no one knew which direction to run. I spent the day limping across the countryside as fast as me stump would allow, looking in creeks and under boulders and even in big piles of horse biscuits for that blasted boot. Now and then I'd see another holish racer, and he'd pile at me just to show, slow me down, whether I had the boot or not. I'd get back on me feet and trapes on, praying with one breath to the maker that I'd find the boot, and with the next that I wouldn't. Why pray that you wouldn't? Janner asked. Because finding the boot's only half the fight. Think how hard it would be to get it clear back to Finley without getting caught and beaten. Well, the maker seemed to curse me and bless me both, because I rounded a hill and saw McDulloch's boot on a stone in the center of a creek. I stood there a minute, waiting for some burly fellow to tackle me, but there weren't a soul in sight. I whispered Wendelin's name, snatched that boot, and hoofed it with all of me might over the hills to the field of Finley. When I talked the last rise, I saw the crowds all gathered around the circle of the field. From every direction, giant bearded men snorted and raced at me like mad toothy cows. And I tell you, I would have preferred toothy cows to the wrath about to sit down on me. An outsider hadn't won the Bannock Durga in a thousand years. Poto stared at the fire and spoke in a low voice. I spotted Wendelin. She was like a white shore on a drowning sailor. I ran for me life for that green circle of field in the distance. A stampede, a curse, and angry Holishmen followed me like thunder, and they were gaining. 
I didn't even see the line of sneaky ones who had circled back to ambush whoever showed up for the boot. They came at me from both sides and more from behind. Poto leaned back in his chair and took his time relighting his pipe. That's all I remember. What? The three children said in unison. I didn't win, of course, Poto said with a wink. They trampled me, snatched the boot, and fought over it for the rest of the day. You'll see at the Bannock in the spring that all the real action happens at that moment. When some poor fool shows up at the finish line with the boot, you can imagine how rough it gets and how big the fellow must be who finally manages to get that boot to the desk. Take Rudrick, for example. But what about Wendelin? Janner asked. Da woke to her kiss on me lips. Photo closed his eyes with a smile. The boys covered their faces and groaned. Lily sighed with bliss. I was so tired and battered, I could hardly walk. But she pulled me to my feet and put me on her donkey and took me home. Her father, Cargan, came to see me every day, and he became one of my best friends. We married in the bright summer right there on the front lawn. The story settled over the room, and Janner's heart was warm. But, Grandpa, he said after a moment, what does this have to do with school? Because you'll all have to walk through your own Bannock Durga. The Hollis children don't care if you're the jewels of Anaria. All they know is you're outsiders. It's like that all over here we are. But in the Hollows, that kind of mistrust involves more roughness than usual. Be ready. I don't want you starting a single fight. The only time you're allowed to swing first is in defense of the helpless. So stick together. Understand? Yes, sir. Janner said, and the children looked at one another. Kalmar looked worried, and Janner knew he had good reason. If the Hollish folk treated Poto that way, he shuddered to imagine how the children would take to a gray fang in their school. It's time to go, Naya said. You're going to be with me, right? Kalmar whispered to Janner. I'm a throne warden, Janner said. Of course I will. Janner remembered Artham leaping into the rock roach den in Glipwood Forest, talons cutting through the air, coming th to their defense, heedless of his own safety. Janner gulped. He was scared to death. 